Thank you for the And the, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ivan uh, Gutierrez Urrutia from uh, Max Planck Institute of Iron Research. Uh, the title of his talk is Simplex in a Cup of Steel. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank the organization, organization just to give me the opportunity to uh, present you some of our activities in um, high strength and ductile low density steels in um, Max Planck Institute for Iron Research in Dusseldorf. Uh, this is a joint uh, project with uh, several members of our lab, uh, Jacob Sell, Ross Marceau, Pierre Choi, and Professor Gabe. So, um, why not? Another banana plot, hopefully the last one. So, yeah, well, I, I don't have to explain too much about uh, what are the different uh, steel grades that we have here. So, uh, well, total elongation versus tensile strength, engineering, uniaxial uh, properties. And just to show you where we are with these materials in terms of properties, we are in the right direction. We are exactly here. And with uh, this low density, high strength steels, we are um, basically able to uh, develop materials with a standing combination of ductility and strength. This is engineering numbers, uh, be careful. So about 100% uh, ductility up to 800 degrees and 1.5 gigapascal, 40% ductility. Okay, so um, uh, the reason behind this one is the standing strength hardening capacity of these materials, where it's mainly associated to uh, the so-called twin induced plasticity effect, and also the formation of nanoparticle order uh, carbons. So uh, within uh, these alloys, uh, this is what I call simplex steels, which is mainly uh, pure austenitic, uh, highly alloyed austenitic steels. And uh, these triplex steels here, named after uh, Professor Fumaya from our, our lab uh, some time ago. So if we go into detail, um, simplex steels are mainly purely austenite. The austenite is pretty stable due to the high content in manganese. Uh, these alloys uh, typically have uh, about 20, 25, up to 30% in weight percent. And so far, we, are, we have mainly investigated two main alloy systems. The one, iron, manganese, aluminum, carbon, which is a development of the classical uh, deep steels, iron, manganese, carbon. And the other one developed by Professor Fromayer in our lab something like uh, 15 years ago, which is the iron, manganese, aluminum, silicon. It does not contain uh, any carbon. And, and basically, these um, steels are characterized by a standing combination of ductility, pretty high, moderate uh, uh, tensile strength. And on the other hand, we have the triplex steels. So the triplex steels, uh, it's pretty tricky. So uh, these are, again, austenitic matrix with uh, nanocarbides. These are order uh, carbides of uh, an FCC structure. Later on, I will comment you uh, what is this about. And uh, also formation of a right. However, the formation of a right here uh, is not clear. The mechanism is not clear in terms of the different alloys, according to the literature. But here, the formation of ferrite is mainly uh, located at grain boundaries. But on the other hand, in the recent years, we have uh, a different uh, alloys coming mainly from post in South Korea, where uh, they have developed a duplex kappa as well. But here, the difference is that the matrix is austenite and ferrite. According to the, uh, the different compositions of manganese, we can go from a duplex to a fully ferritic uh, matrix. And they are also adding uh, silicon as well. And just to uh, show you uh, what we have here is the classical iron aluminum alloys developed some, some time ago, uh, which are in terms of mechanical properties at room temperature are pretty off. Yeah, so as I said before, low density high manganese steels. Uh, what is the term high manganese steel? Well, it's not a, a clear answer from that. But we can uh, classify according to uh, about uh, steel grades with uh, content in manganese about 20%, which is basically in this area here. And all these steel grades develop uh, currently by uh, mainly main activities from uh, South Korea, not only from there, which uh, they contain basically uh, contain lower than 10%. So in terms of manganese, this is the classification that we can claim here. And uh, where is the low density coming here is mainly by the addition of aluminum, not only aluminum, because as I've shown you before, there are some steel grades with, uh, with silicon. 
And in these steel grades, uh, basically, uh, each percent of addition of aluminum uh, reduces one percent of density. So from this perspective, only from this perspective, uh, the most interesting uh, steel grades will be this triplex, because here we can go really high in content in aluminum, up to roughly 16, 15 percent, something like that. And also all these um, steel grades here. OK, this is from engineering point of view. And now let's go and uh, talk about the formation mechanisms. That this is what I'm interested in. So uh, simplex steels. Uh, this is what I call simplex steels. For me, just to um, separate with another classical multiphase steels, because simplex is, is from that point is, is simple. But as I will show you, in terms of the formation structure, it's not simple at all. Uh, so as I said before, uh, this is mainly a highly alloyed austenite. And here we can, uh, due to the alloying, basically uh, the reason behind uh, the standing strain hardening capacity is uh, what we call a multiple strain hardening behavior, which is uh, basically a two-stage uh, hardening behavior. The first one is related with a dislocation structure hardening, and the other one is the formation twinning. So basically what we do here in these alloys is instead of uh, promoting twinning since the beginning, like uh, what happens in the so-called tip steels, uh, the ternary system where basically the strain had an increase at the early stages of the formation. Here is plot the stress uh, leading to the classical having the strain hardening. This is well known. Here what uh, we do is basically we gradually increase the strain hardening. And uh, with uh, this, what we basically do is that the exhaustion of the strain hardening capacity of the alloy uh, is uh, delayed to higher strain levels. So basically, as a consequence of that, we are not making use of all the, uh, of all the power of the, of the twinning in terms of uh, straining hardening, in terms of refining on the microstructure. But first, we refine the microstructure by a dislocation substructure and later on by a twinning. So uh, for that, we need a specific uh, dislocation configuration in order to uh, promote our understanding uh, strain hardening capacity by, by dislocation structure. So this is the uh, typical um, dislocation structure evolution of um, simplex steel. Be careful, this is in atomic percent. Uh, so uh, the early stage of deformation, uh, classical configuration that can be found in, 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 in FCC materials, so lomer cut locks. But interestingly, uh, is the formation of um, highly dense dislocation walls, terlow lattices with a characteristic a crystallographic orientation. These are dislocation based on the structure. Be careful. In order to understand the strain hardening uh, mechanisms, we need to characterize the crystallographic orientation dependence of all these features. And interestingly, uh, this uh, dislocation substructure is uh, evolved into a more a wavy type of dislocation substructure, which is basically uh, the frequency of cross slip is increasing. So uh, at higher stress levels, uh, this uh, dislocation substructure is replaced into cell blocks, dislocation cells, also containing a characteristic um, crystallographic orientation dependence. Uh, this is IPF parallel to the tensile axis under a uniaxial uh, tensile stress. So this is the deformation substructure in the first stage of hardening. And as soon as tuning is active, well, we promote the formation of nanotwins in order to characterize the thickness of all these features. Be careful, we only have to place the planes of these interfaces edge on uh, in order to uh, characterize the thickness of, of, of these features. As you can see here, uh, these are um, FCC materials, so the, uh, nanotwins are formed, are distributed into bundles. And as you can see, we have a distribution in thickness. Uh, so fine up to 10 nanometers, but we can go up to easily 50 nanometers or even 100 nanometers. Again, this is a stress-based mechanism. So even at higher uh, stress levels, we have a twin substructure that is characterized by a corresponding crystallographic orientation dependence, which means that under uniaxial tensile stress, we have uh, grains close to one, one, two, with a lamellar twin substructure. Only one twin system is mainly active. A grains close to the one, one parallel to the tensile axis, we have uh, multiple twinning systems. And um, of course, we even have grains that are stable against twinning. Yeah, so this is just basically due to the, the nature of, of, of uh, slip twinning 
which is stress-based. So uh, we need to understand the crystallographic orientation dependence of all these features. So this is corresponding to um, uh, simplex steels. And if we take a look to the iron manganese aluminum carbon fish diagram, this was uh, done 20 years ago. Well, if we, we can take a look to the iron 30% manganese. So basically, uh, well, this is the simplex, pure astonite, nothing new. But as soon as we add more aluminum, we are going in this direction where the formation of a uh, kappa phase is, is formed. And also, as you can see here, even uh, uh, ferrite. Today I will not talk about the formation of ferrite uh, because this is mainly uh, formed at grain boundaries. So it's mainly uh, um, controlling the damage mechanisms, basically. So uh, in, in the triplex today, I will just concentrate on the austenite and kappa. So as you can see here, if we reduce the uh, amount of manganese, basically the ferrite is much more stable, and this is what we have in these um, steel grades here. No? So as you can see here, it's quite easy. In this uh, system, we have austenite, highly alloyed with manganese, ferrite, and kappa. So this is very interesting. So uh, according to the literature, uh, kappa um, carbides is uh, FCC or the phase perovskite type, L1, 2, like uh, the classical iron-3 aluminum carbon, well known in uh, iron aluminides. So here, um, uh, with respect to the, to the literature, this is what uh, the stoichiometric structure should, be, should look like. So if one go to the TM, no problem at all, because it immediately can uh, perform tilting experiments, just placing O1 uh, so on axis, and immediately realize that this is an FCC extract. A part of that, no more information. So uh, now I would like to show you uh, the difference in the kappa phase, whereas the matrix is austenite or is ferrite. So in the austenitic matrix, here uh, is an alloy that we are currently investigating in our lab, an atomic percent, highly alloyed again. So uh, the formation of uh, the kappa phase is like this, at 600 degrees, at different annealing times, nano size cuboidal play type of particles are formed um, within a, a range into what we, call, we can call cigars. And you can see the size of these uh, nanoparticles. Up, after two weeks of 600 degrees, they are only increased up to 30, 40 nanometers in size. They follow a cube, cube orientation. So it's similar to the game that we have been in gamma, gamma prime superalloys. And also it's interesting the high thermal stability of these phases in terms of, of, of size. No? Up to two weeks at 600 degrees, we are currently below 50 nanometers in size. And also the high level of coherency of the interfaces. So uh, of course, upon uh, the time, but basically we have uh, coherent and semi-coherent interfaces and this has a huge role on the mechanical properties. So uh, understanding gamma kappa interfaces, this is an ongoing uh, collaboration with Neruska and Julich. We are running a high-res uh, microscopy analysis of the interfaces. So basically, we are interested in uh, determining the crystal structure of the kappa. And what's more interesting is the lattice mismatch. So understanding much more clear what is the uh, nature of the interfaces and later on uh, upon the formation. So this is some, are some um, early uh, preliminary analysis of the gamma kappa interfaces at the different annealing times. These are play type particles. So, so far our, uh, our estimations, we have to improve. That's my question before, because we have uh, to deal with extremely thin samples in order to nicely characterize the interface. But so uh, our uh, estimates right now um, uh, look like this, where the coherent interfaces that we have right now is in, at, at these annealing conditions is below 0.2%. But we also have semi-coherent interfaces of about 2 or 3%, according to the literature, to according to the, um, classical textbooks uh, and material science, is more or less coherent, semi-coherent. So uh, uh, this is ongoing, but just to show you uh, the interest in high-res uh, an, uh, analysis of the interfaces of these particles. So uh, we are also characterizing uh, kappa carbides in our stenetic uh, matrix by 3D APT. So these are reconstructed um, isoconcentration surfaces. We are using a nine atomic percent in this uh, presentation at different annealing times. 
you can see that it's very nice for uh, APT analysis because in one needle we have several, several particles. Uh, so we can nicely identify the partitioning behavior. So you want to uh, take a look to the um, partitioning behavior to the 1D profiles of the concentration profiles. Look like this one, for instance. One uh, can immediately see uh, something that is pretty interesting is that the ratio between iron and manganese is 2 to 1. So that means that we don't have any stoichiometric uh, phase. Uh, we are off of the uh, proposal stoichiometric phase. But on the other side, we have uh, extremely coherent interfaces. So for this system, is the right system to, to go. So um, more analysis um, in terms of the concentration profiles. Uh, we can use the so-called proxigrams, which is mainly a, um, an analysis uh, through a volume of the different interfaces. So it's giving more uh, reliable um, statistics. And uh, well, from here one can calculate uh, partition ratios. Uh, well, basically one can see the high thermal stability of these phases. Uh, manganese is not partitioning at all. And carbon up to two weeks, 600 degrees, the ratio is almost to three. One can also use uh, this type of diagrams uh, to estimate the volume fraction here of the particles in the APT needles. We have very few of them. So this is currently ongoing. We have to better evaluate this. Uh, the formation mechanisms of uh, these materials. So this is a, a uniaxial um, stress strain curve for a simplex still. If we use uh, this uh, triplex alloys, well, if we only uh, anneal below the formation of these kappa phases, it's very interesting because this location structure is completely different to that uh, revealed by the simplex alloys. Uh, we have uh, mainly formation of microbands. So basically the message here is the uh, addition of aluminum here is changing uh, the formation of uh, or the development of these uh, these locations extractors. Also analyzing the crystallographic orientation dependence of all these patterns. And uh, this is um, uh, nearing time while kappa carbides are uh, observed, but there is, I mean, the, the distribution is pretty heterogeneous. So basically here we have highly alloyed alloy in solid solution. Now if we go to the formation of kappa phases, for instance, 24 hours, 600 degrees. What we are doing currently is analyzing the formation mechanisms. One can immediately see uh, in terms of uh, properties, uh, the gel stress is like a factor of two. And it's also uh, moderate to quite good uh, ductility. So this is what we are currently evaluating, the deformation mechanisms. This is quite complex because um, this is an STN images uh, where we can see all these low angle wind boundaries, these location patterns. When one uh, take a look to the different uh, areas of these particles, of this uh, mic extractor, we can, uh, this is our uh, weak beam TM images, we can uh, nicely see all one type of bypassing here uh, in those uh, low angle wind boundaries where this location density is higher. I cannot be nicely seen here, but we have uh, mainly multiples, which this is uh, um, in an indication that cross slip is, uh, is, is mainly enabled in, in, this, uh, in these areas. And also we have serum of particles localized, but this uh, mechanism is, is, is not relevant uh, for this uh, microstructure. So as you can see, uh, uh, in order to understand the role of, of the particles in uh, in the strain hanging for this system is, is, is pretty much more complex because we have different areas, we have different dislocation uh, density in terms of uh, dislocation patterns, and this is much more challenging. So just to conclude, as I said before, what happens in a Fritica uh, uh, matrix? So this is a recent work for uh, one of our colleagues, and you can immediately see that the morphology is completely different. So kappa carbides, the interfaces are semi-coherent, incoherent. APT analysis furthermore uh, uh, has revealed the non stoichiometric structure of, of these particles. Uh, these authors pr uh, propose uh, this type of, uh, of uh, structure where basically they suggest that uh, iron is being substituted in the, uh, in the aluminum sites. And this is uh, dependent on the temperature of annealing. So as you can see here, to uh, analysis by APT of different steel grades and uh, have confirmed the non stoichiometric structure of, of these particles. This is maybe not surprising because nobody has done it before. 
with such kind of accuracy. Of course, if we compare partitioning behavior of the different alloys, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit different. Here in, in the ferritic matrix, you can see the partitioning behavior of carbon is two times higher than in, 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 in austenitic matrix. And, and manganese is also partitioning to the kappa respect to the austen. So this is, uh, gives us an understanding of why the formation of uh, coherent uh, kappa phases in the austenitic matrix with respect to semi-coherent, incoherent uh, kappa phases in ferritic uh, matrix. So just to conclude, well, uh, these materials are quite promising in terms of high strength, low density steels, in terms of uh, strength hardening in the formation mechanisms. These are pretty interesting materials, and uh, we can consider like model systems to analyze uh, different interesting issues here. And also, uh, not only from a uh, strain hardening behavior, but also from the point of view of understanding the formation of uh, these kappa phases. Be careful. This is also interesting. We can analyze gamma kappa, alpha kappa, or even in duplex, what is happening when we have a matrix with a gamma alpha. And just that the, the formation mechanisms uh, are pretty interesting to be investigated. With all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this amazing talk, and now we are open for questions. Uh, anyone? Although this question is not relevant to the microstructure evolution, are you thinking about joining these alloys and welding and everything? So, because how will the stability of these carbides and everything? Yeah. So this is a, a good question. You know, in order to just put, let's say, into a technological application these materials with such level of, of high alloy, like carbon or whatever. So the, uh, the stability of these phases uh, for this particular alloy so far is up to 700 degrees, the 750, they are dissolved. But we have to check you know, the, the stability of, of the size, of where they are growing, how can uh, have uh, any effect on welding. So this is something that is ongoing. Uh, but of course, this is something that has, must be evaluated in order to have, uh, let's say, real technological materials and not academic materials. No? If I may extend the question for the discussion's sake, you said the thermal stability is quite high. Right? Yeah. So if I go to the Austin and come back, will it stay there? Sure, sure. No, I mean, thermal stability is relative. No? What I was just mentioning is thermal stability is relative with another system. It's a person, so how? that after two weeks, 600 degrees, we still remain uh, nanocarbide particles. This is an indication that these alloys, why not, can uh, exhibit uh, good mechanical properties for higher temperature in terms of, uh, so this is mainly my idea, is my explanation. Well, any other questions? Beautiful characterization work, Ivan. I congratulate you for that. But I, my question, I'm sure it's a very simple question, but I am not familiar with this system. In the simplex iron manganese, aluminum, silicon um, uh, grades, mm. do, do you have carbon at all? Or is very low carbon content or you don't have carbon at all? Is that a intermetallic instead of a steel? Can you extend a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So many thanks. Yeah, so uh, the alloy system that I have present here is without silicon. But nevertheless, if you, add, uh, if you go in the other direction, aluminum silicon, in principle, the carbon content is very low. It's very low. So uh, uh, be careful also with the addition of silicon, because silicon can promote uh, ordering. So you can go in the direction of iron-3 silicon. So be careful. But in austenitic uh, phases, uh, there is no ordering. So it's basically the game of highly alloyed austenite, where basically you are promoting slip, twinning, and so on. Uh, be careful because in the duplex systems where the manganese content is lower, uh, there are some studies uh, where very nice uh, observe uh, ordering of B2 type of ordering. Any more questions? So, very interesting. You know, in the um, nickel based super alloys, uh, there's a very, very clever mechanism of controlling the lattice mismatch. Uh, is that you vary the aluminum to titanium ratio. Mm -hmm. Is there a similar thing you can do with kappa? Hopefully. Sorry? Hopefully. But what elements? Ah, what elements? Yeah. We still don't know. So what we have done so far is the first step is this quaternary system. Let's yeah, evaluate where is the uh, lattice mismatch 
within a, a regime. And later on, as, as, you, as, as, as you suggest, the idea will be how can we control the lattice mismatch? Because here one game that is, is in the table is uh, controlling the lattice mismatch for uh, higher temperature applications. But this is uh, still open. We have I, mean, I, I don't mean for high temperature applications, but you know the passage of dislocations. Kappa is not a particularly penetrable particle, right? Yeah, so it depends on the size of these guys. But I mean, in terms of order, it's extremely ordered. So I guess that the antiphase boundary will be very, very high. Mm. So that's why it will not be very penetrable. But um, so my comment is in terms of uh, controlling the lattice mismatch you know, mm. through the chemistry, this is something that is ongoing. And and are you sure that kappa is cubic? I'm sure. So, um, yeah, this is a good question. Sure and not. So, according to the diffraction patterns, conventional TM, you can nicely see that it's an order 1, 2 type. And it's, it's quite simple because you see extra spots. But what we are currently interested uh, in doing is by Harris characterizing uh, the lattice uh, parameter along the two directions, whether this is real, cubic, or not. This is still ongoing. But according to the literature, this is having never done. So it's had only been analyzed by XRD, XRD, for instance, and always assuming an L12 type of structure. So the real structure probably is different. How to control the kappa kappa in order to improve the, the elongation in the trip, uh, triplex steel? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, this is a good question because uh, the formation of kappa in terms of annealing time is uh, promoting uh, ferrite at green boundaries. So this is what we have seen, not in this alloy, but with another alloys. If you add more aluminum, for instance, uh, since the beginning, you have uh, probably uh, smaller particles, but ferrite is forming at green boundaries. So in terms of damage mechanism of tennis ductility, it's even worse. So it, it's a compromise between uh, what size of particle would you want to have in the interior of the grain boundaries and at, at, at grain boundaries. So in terms of strength ductility is not only one parameter like kappa, but also for right, is playing a role. And this is depending on, on its system and that of course must be evaluated, definitely. Uh, I believe we have an internet question. Um, yeah, a, a comment from uh, Ian from Asamamita. Um, Related to um, Harry's question, there's a paper from Japanese researcher in which carbon, uh, oh, sorry, not carbon, uh, cobalt, cobalt. Uh, reduced the lattice mismatch between copper and austenite in the same system. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, first I'm interested in the quaternary system, understanding, and later on, of course. But nice for the comment. Yeah, I will check that. All right. Do we have any more questions? Uh, thank you. This is not so much a science question, but um, can, you, can you tell us anything about the state of technology or implementation? Of this? Uh, uh, because the, the, these are very interesting um, properties with low density and. Have you got through this already? Have you got through this? Already? Yes. No, even, even cold roll. I have cold roll uh, uh, these alloys up to 50% cold rolling. No problem at all. Would Beyond like that, some problem. Would you like to come back to uh, John Fierce's question? Oh, but, but please, uh, yeah, so regarding the, the technology, you know. Um, yeah, so as, as, as well, as, as, as you can see, we have mainly focusing on the formation mechanisms of understanding the influence of the microstructure and the strain hazard in understanding mechanical properties. But in order uh, of, uh, of uh, producing a real technological uh, material, we have to consider other issues like welding, uh, like corrosion. I'm pretty sure the manganese content, be careful. And in terms of uh, industrial applications, so that's why basically the most ex or let's say feasible materials in order to be uh, produced right now are this lower manganese content from South Korea. I think that uh, in, in from POSCO, I'm pretty sure they are 
are producing in, in larger amounts. And with higher manganese content, I'm aware of uh, yeah, one company in Germany where they are pretty interested on that. And for scaling up, you know, industrial scale. But as you can see from the microstructural point of view, mechanical behavior, these are pretty exciting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is not uh, really a scientific one. It's, uh, it's each time when I see this low density, mm. I, got, I got a little problem with that. I know that when people develop high magnet steels or medium, or for your case, even low magnet steels, you put aluminum. Mm. a little bit, and uh, some uh, silicon, and uh, probably up to 1% or more than that carbon. But that doesn't really reduce the density much, does it? Yes, so it's, yeah, so, so that's the point. No? It's, it's, com <laughs> it's just, a, just a comment. <laughs> no, you are completely right. No? So if, if, if you mention here, where is the attraction for that? It's the aluminum. But we only add in in triplex, let's say 10%, 12% are more or less exciting. The question is, is can you call this low density steels? Yeah, uh, the answer is uh, yes, you can, because if you reduce by 10%, there is no aluminum alloy in the world which can compete on specific strength for automotive applications. Correct, correct. No, no, that's exactly what I said, is that if you can reduce it by 10%, there is no aluminum alloy in the world which can compete with steel. Yeah, I mean, here we can go up to gel strength of uh, one gigapascal. Yeah. So you can tune down your, your size of the carbide distribution or whatever, and it's pretty active, no? All right. Um, so another question. OK, of, um, sorry, final question from internet. Uh, is, uh, is there any information on the mechanical behavior under changing strain path? In part under revision, uh, Bossinger effect. A strain path, Bossinger effect in, uh, in, uh, in Kappa, I'm not aware of that. In Simplex, for sure. In Simplex, you can take a look to uh, the work done in the last 10, 15 years in the twip steels. And I'm aware of a lot of publications analyzing uh, compression, uh, tension, anisotropy, Bossinger effect. But in triplex, I'm not aware, and this is a good idea, because I will check what is happening there. Yeah, because it's, it's not on. Thank you. OK, so that's the end of this session.